dogs, cans, and dead snipers. The place was Sirte, Libya, on the coast along the Gulf of Sidra. The time was at the height of the civil war in that country, the first one. There were two. The players were U.S. operators we'll call John and Tiny. A Libyan rebel commander named Silverback is in our story, named after the gorilla because he had that kind of hair and was kind of big. Another unnamed rebel commander and then two young Libyan rebel fighters and a few enemy snipers working for Muammar Gaddafi, the dead dictator of that place. So the guys are standing in broad daylight looking at Silverback, who's grinning at him. They do the bro hug and that traditional weird two-cheek pretend kiss thing common over there. And he introduces them to a dude named uh, the Commander. Now, John wasn't sure if this guy was an actual commander or whether he was just in charge of this group of people or whether he had just renamed himself commander for the fun of it because he had run into some guys in Afghanistan, John that is, and this guy had named himself Engineer because he wanted the uh, cachet that came with that title. So the guys covered their ears as they watched a, a lanky Libyan in a sleeveless camouflage t-shirt with a dark green helmet kind of hanging lopsidedly off his head, set off a rocket from his truck. He was using a remote control box with wires that ran back to the rocket pod. The rockets were bolted down to the bed of the truck. The whole vehicle shook back and forth and orange flame streaks off just to visit some destruction on some other part of this city. John and Tiny were standing in a little motor pool area with a bunch of Mad Max looking vehicles meeting the commander with Silverback. Before John could properly say hey to the guy called Commander, a hand-painted, desert camouflaged tan truck filled with a bunch of bleeding rebels roared up in a cloud of choking, talcum powder-like dust. One rebel's unconscious. He's been shot in the stomach. The other has been wounded in the leg. And another one had been shot through the hand. One after another, they came in with bloody shirts, headscarves or anything else they had been able to uh, find to wrap up their wounds and stop the bleed. They didn't have good eye facts and they didn't have hemostatic dressing like we have today. Surrounded by the noise of the rockets screaming from their launch tubes in the background, machine guns are ripping burst from trucks and the uh, artillery is just kind of hitting nearby. It's just a dull thud. Medical personnel such as they were are darting from one person to another, trying to bandage wounds. People are screaming. They're cutting blood-soaked clothing off these guys. The skies are dark and cloudy, and it kind of set a somber tone as John looks at the blood covering the bed of the truck. It just starts to grow and cover the whole thing, seeping into all the cracks. Somebody said that a helo was being called in from Miserata to pick these poor guys up. While other rebels are trying to find a spot for a suitable landing zone, that you know this is just a mass chaos event. All they needed really was a flat space with no power lines, something that the rotors wouldn't hit, something like a soccer field or a big assembly area, a park with no trees. Anything like that would have done would have been fine. And they settled on a soccer field. So Silverback is talking to the commander, and the commander, you gotta get a picture of him in your head. Skinny dude, he wore desert BDUs. The old school kind, like the chocolate chip kind from the 90s. A baseball cap. He had a flak jacket on from the Vietnam era that was real bulky. His pants are tucked into his black combat boots. There was a pistol on his hip as well, but it didn't have a magazine in it. And the radio in his hand was an off-the-shelf commercial, unencrypted radio. Worthless. He slaps the two Americans on the shoulder and he says, Shukran, Shukran which is Arabic for thank you, thank you. Just thanking, thanking John and Tiny for being there, I guess. And then he's back on his radio again, spinning on his heel, walking off to yell at somebody. So 
The silverback says, you know, the, the commander's having a really difficult time with snipers. And John guessed the commander kind of figured that John and Tiny might have a neat idea, a cool weapon, or could even call in uh, airstrikes to help him out. But unfortunately for him, they didn't have any of that for him. Well, John said, let's get a look at the area where the fire's coming from at least. And he yells that out. Silverback translates it to the commander. John's thinking, you know, at least they can try to find the snipers. That wasn't their job. They were here for something else. But it would help build rapport with the locals. And what to do about them once they found them, that was another problem altogether. So the commander hit the radio. A few minutes later, truck pulls up with two dudes inside. John and Tiny jump in with them, and they go taking off down the road into town. They turn onto a flooded road that is filled with floating trash everywhere, dark black water. They dismount. Each man's carrying an AK-47. The Americans both had on plate carriers and gunfighter belts on top of their cry precision uniforms that had the labels and tags and names removed. So there was nothing on there that could identify them as being an American. So they started slowly moving through this putrid, stinking, ankle-deep water, heading into a destroyed building. The guys they were with tried to reassure them that they were in an area controlled by the rebels for what little good that did. Clearly, they didn't have a lot of control because snipers had become a problem. So their two escorts took them deeper inside the building. Rubble trash, evidence of humanity trying to scratch out an existence from literally nothing was everywhere. They moved up some broken partial steps staircase to the second floor, which put them moving parallel to the road of concern. They crawled below the blasted out holes where windows used to be. And when they reached the interior wall, they just hopped through another hole called a mouse hole. Mouse holes were blown in walls inside so people could move through the building without exposing themselves through windows and doors to snipers or having to go outside to go around. At what they judged to be close to the T intersection, they got down on their bellies. They inched forward to a small hole right around ground level. The older of the men who was with them pointed up that intersection and mumbled quietly the word, Kanas, Kanas, Arabic for sniper. This intersection was the place the rebels were trying to clear, but the effective fire by the hidden marksmen was preventing that. Through this tiny hole in the wall, just a little larger than a golf ball, was a view of that intersection, that road. John pulls out his uh, eight power monocular, and he sees that they're facing the southern side of what used to be a four-story terracotta colored apartment block overlooking that intersection. The space between the intersection and that building was essentially no man's land. It was clear and open, as was the entire block in front of the building. The structure was in a position that dominated the area and everything in front of it, covering nearly 270 degrees. Anytime somebody moved, they got zapped. And in daylight, it's nearly impossible to see where the shots come from if the shooter's hidden inside a building. Gaddafi's snipers were doing what snipers did hiding inside the building, one or maybe even two rooms deep, concealing their muzzle blast and shooting from cracks, holes, or any other openings they could see through. The rebels' momentum was faltering because of them. Every time the rebels sent people out in this area, they had to dive for cover in the maze of buildings or else they were dropped in their tracks. There was one lone Mad Max looking military truck the rebels owned that was in the road. In it, a body was in the front seat, his head listing off to the left as a testament to the fact. Snipers are a unique breed of warrior. In the United States, military snipers are considered strategic assets. They wear on the enemy's psyche because they never see where the shot came from. One minute you're standing there next to your buddy and the next minute his head is a pink mist. They provide intelligence on the battlefield and they're extremely cost effective. For example, um, the Defense Department found that during the American War in Vietnam, 
it would take roughly $23,000 in bullets for the average soldier to kill one person. A sniper, on the other hand, could kill a person for 17 cents. The training to be a sniper is rough and is long. The Army's basic sniper school is five weeks. The Marines, 11 weeks. SEALs take three months. An organization I used to work with, paramilitary snipers could hit well over a mile out in under one minute from flash to bang. That's getting set, doing their ballistic calculations for wind, bullet drop, the altitude, which affects the density of the air, and that affects the bullet's flight, as well as the even rotation of the earth, and then taking that shot. Calculating all those things and then taking the shot in under a minute. In relative comparison, the Libyans were not real snipers, but more like dudes hiding in trash with a scoped rifle, maybe, firing off a shot or two and getting lucky. They, had the, they didn't have the training, they didn't have the equipment, they lacked top-of-the-line optics and weapon systems, they lacked range finders, kestrel wind meters, heck, even the organization I used to work with had tiny drones the shooter or the sniper could send down range that would report the wind speed at the terminal end of the shot back to the shooter. Libyans had no formal schooling in stalking, building a hide site, terminal ballistics. That's what the bullet does when it hits what it's shooting at or whatever you're aiming towards or whatever it comes in contact with. Uh, they didn't know about calculating adjustments for windage or elevation or making high angle shots. I mean, yeah, there were a few decent rifle shots, but most were told to go kill somebody and they learned by trial and error what worked and what did not. And it was strictly on the job training. The Americans saw a few of them with, you know, decent rifles like Dragunov SVDs or the H&K G3S with scopes, but there weren't a lot of those around. Some dudes were just firing with iron sights from a hide. Gaddafi's Libyans also didn't fight at night, and T Tiny knew this, and so he said, hey, why don't you send your people over tonight and just kill them in their sleep? Just go through the camp and just start shooting them in the teeth. And the old man who was next to him in the area they're looking out said, nah, we don't fight at night. He whispered this, and when he got through talking, everybody starts easing back to start that return journey through the rubble. Neither side, the rebels nor Gaddafi's side fought at night much, and it wasn't due to manners. They just didn't have the night vision equipment, and they did not train to do that. By contrast, though, that was the way John and Tani preferred to fight, in the dark, quiet, out of sight. It was a shooting, not a gunfight. Basically wearing something like that. Just, just good old American night vision. They just wanted to be in a shooting, like I said, not a gunfight. Uh, because if that fight was fair, that just meant that they had failed to plan the thing properly. So there's an old saying that um, the pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change and the realist adjust his sails. So John and Tiny, after seeing what they just looked at, we're now adjusting their sails. Back on the street, the man took a knee next to the truck for a minute and kicked some options around amongst the two of them. See, they were here to set up an intelligence network to help the rebels and to help them coordinate the search for Gaddafi. They were not here to get bogged down trying to clear out a sniper at tactical level stuff. And this made the second time that John had been caught up in this little racket over here. And that's a story for another day. So um, Tiny, as they're kneeling by the truck, says, Hey, brother, I know these dudes. They've, they've got scoped rifles, but they'll never be able to hit anything from back there. Plus, God didn't make enough time to wait that long, and they don't have the skill set. John says, That's true. They're wanting us to do it for them, but that's not what we're here for. But we'll, let's figure something out. So, you know, Tiny's like, Roger that. How about putting big lead on foreheads? Hmm. 
Tiny said it with a grin, and this grin crept into a smile through his beard that got so wide that it thinned his eyes. John knew what he was talking about right off the bat. Tiny was talking about just hammering these dudes off the map with overwhelming firepower. To do that, it required good intelligence, which they had. They just laid eyes on the building where the guys were shooting from. On top of that, there was a better than reasonable chance of avoiding collateral damage because every civilian had already left and those who remained likely were working for the bad guys anyway. So, coming up with that plan, they jumped, they, they drove back to the brief the commander. He liked it and they set to work. John told one of the rebels to round up some cans to make some noise and get some raw meat of any kind. So the cans are gonna be used to make noise and he wanted him to get raw meat. Tiny then turned and pointed to two dudes and he said, you, you, you and you, uh, get your trucks, move them back to where you can fire your rockets at the building where the snipers have been. Those fellows had the, uh, the old BM-21 grad launchers. They didn't have the whole complement of launchers. They had just like four at a time bolted into their truck beds. So Rebel translates this and these dudes set to work getting that done. You might ask, why hadn't they done this already? I mean, they'd certainly blown snipers out of buildings. They were cratered all up and down the side, the, the, you know, the Gulf of Sidra. Buildings had pockmarks and holes and were shattered, pointing to the fact that they had already done this before. But this was when they could identify exactly where they'd been and now it was getting dark and they didn't, they didn't, they couldn't find them which meant another day stuck at this junction. So Tiny goes over and gives the heads up to a few more truck crews with some Russian Dishka and NSV heavy machine guns mounted in their beds. These massive guns were anti-aircraft machine guns. They shot a 12.7 millimeter round and they could knock aircraft out of the sky. So all these guys started to crank up and move out. Then John told Silverback, to have them all move up as quietly as they could, turn their lights off, shut everything down that emits any kind of light at all, and not to go around the corner. Now he probably didn't need to add that last part because they knew what would happen if they did. There was lots of dead dudes laying around to kind of point to that fact. He told another rebel to go find a stray dog. It was getting close to dusk and at the end of the fighting day or so most of them thought. The guy returned with a snarling, pissed off, tan and brown stray on a rope. It was one of about a million of these dogs that looked exactly the same. They seemed to be everywhere in North Africa. And then another rebel showed up with some meat that resembled a goat's ankle and some tin cans, mostly soda cans and tuna cans. Taking out some green 550 cord from his uh, bag, John told the rebel, tie the tuna and the Coke cans to the tail of that stray. He told him to do it. John wasn't going to risk rabies from a pissed off stray dog. Then he said to tell the rest of your people to stay at the corner of those buildings. And when they hear enemy fire from the snipers, they're going to need to push around and unload everything they've got on that building. Now with that, they grabbed the dog and the meat, got in the truck, made sure their lights were off, headed back down to the T intersection. All the Mad Max trucks were already there, just back from the corner, engines on, lights off, waiting. A burly rebel held the screaming, growling mongrel in his arms and followed John, and it was getting seriously hard to see now. John and Tiny switched on their night vision and folded their ear pro in place. Burly man put the dog on the ground, still holding him by the rope. He was a skinny little thing and he hadn't eaten anything worthwhile probably in days and John counted seven vertebrae through his skin and at least as many ribs. When Burley put the meat in front of the dog's snout, he tried to devour it. He was snapping and snarling as Burley held him back. John just gave him a whiff of it just to know, look, here's some meat. Then stepping out as far as he dared in the dark, darkening rather, night, John threw the goat as far up the road as he could in the direction of the no man's land and then he jumps back around the corner just as Burley lets that dog go. 
Then all three men run for the trucks. Nothing happened at first. Nobody shot at them from a building down the road because either the bad guys couldn't see them, they weren't looking, or they just weren't there. But when the dog took off after the meat, dragging this bouquet of steel and aluminum cans, it clanged and banged. All hell broke loose from that building. Within a few seconds, the enemy guns opened up, machine guns and snipers and AK-47s shooting in the direction of the noise. Anyone could see the flashes of orange and white light flickering across the walls of the adjacent buildings and as those skies got darker and the clouds came in and the sun set. John and Tiny watched through their nods and saw all the flickering. You could see where the bad guys were just from that alone. They were just spraying and praying, likely fooled by the dog's noise into thinking that some rebels were advancing on them. Now it's go time. And when the other side started shooting, the Mad Max trucks raced around the corner, the final few yards through those flooded streets. Water shot up behind them in rooster tails as they ran to that, drove to that intersection. The men with the BM-21 grads in their bed poured everything they had into the face of the building from where the muzzle flashes were coming from. The dishkas and the NVS heavy machine guns mounted into the beds of those trucks just turned them on. They roared. It was a long, continuous orange flame. It looked like a fire-breathing dragon sending shelf casings flying all over the place and shaking those tiny four-wheel Toyota and Nissan pickup trucks back and forth. Soon it seemed like that all the rebels, whether with a rifle, a machine gun, RPGs, or even pistols, were shooting something in the direction of those bad dudes in that building in what became one enormous, continuous roar. Once the shooting stopped, the rebels hauled away from the spot like they just robbed a 7-Eleven. They likely were afraid that Gaddafi's artillery was going to respond and counter battery strike them, but not a thing happened. In fact, a, uh, a silence settled like a fog over that smoking battlefield for the first few minutes. It was almost like the city took a huge sigh. The Americans could hear brass casings when they hit, rolling around on hard spots on the ground. Trucks could be heard sloshing in the water as they slowly stopped rocking back and forth from the recoil of those big machine guns in their beds. And then they heard things pick up again, with a dog barking here and there. Sporadic gunfire could be heard across town, and, and then you could hear the response from somebody else's gun somewhere else. Jets shrieked overhead once in a while, and things kind of came back to what was normal for a war zone. No snipers used that spot again, to John's knowledge, and stray dogs became pretty scarce in cert. They likely got the notion that it wasn't a fun place to hang out anymore. If you're wondering what happened to the stray, I don't know. But he was likely gnawing on that goat's ankle in a ditch somewhere, happy as a clam, even with all the gunfire taking place. There's a book out by a lady named Annie Jacobson, and it has a passage that describes paramilitary guys and gals this way. High-level, problem-solving warriors who operate in the most radical, non-permissive combat environments in the world. They must think clearly and act flawlessly in a 360-degree gunfight, in close-quarters combat, in ambush, hit-and-run, snatch-and-grab, and rescue operations. To infiltrate a target, they must be able to fast rope out of helicopters, perform halo and hey ho jumps out of airplanes, walk 12, mile, 12 kilometers or more behind enemy lines, carrying 75 pounds of gear or a wounded soldier. All of this must be performed in any terrain or temperature, on top of a 10,000 foot mountain or in subsurface underwater environments. From sub-zero freezing to 122 degree Fahrenheit heat, the operators need Olympian confidence and stamina. I have nothing more to add.